Good afternoon and welcome to our Grow Native webinar, Restoring Home, The Journey Back to Native with Jane Haslag. My name is Haley Howard and I am the Outreach Coordinator and Education Coordinator for the Missouri Prairie Foundation. I want to welcome you all and thank you for joining us for this webinar today. And thanks to our Grow Native sponsors for 2022. During the presentation, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A section on your screen. And at the end, I will read those out to Jane. This webinar is being recorded and the link will be shared with all of you tomorrow along with resources mentioned during the presentation and Q&A session. And now for some background on Jane. Jane and her husband live on the property in central Missouri where she was raised. In her retirement journey, Jane found her passion as she and her husband worked to restore their property back to its native state. In 2021, Jane completed the Master Pollinator Steward Program through the University of Missouri Extension Center. And in 2022, she completed Missouri Master Naturalist Training. Jane is a member of the Missouri Prairie Foundation Board of Directors. And now we will go ahead and turn it over to Jane. Thank you, Haley. I can't tell you what a blessing it's been to meet the wonderful people who work so hard at the Missouri Prairie Foundation to save our precious remaining remnant prairies. It's been an honor getting to know them. I come to you today as a simple landowner that had a mess and knew we had to do better for our land and for future generations. Many of you already know much of what I will say. But if nothing else, I hope you take away inspiration on how quickly you can make a difference. Home was our small farm. And I grew up chasing wildflowers or chasing butterflies, uh, enjoying wildflowers and listening to the birds, admiring the natural beauty that surrounded me. Many years would pass. My parents aged and it was no longer a working farm. After their death, we purchased six acres and mostly left it to be wildlife habitat except for my attempts to bring back the beauty I had so loved as a child. I made so many mistakes. Repeated efforts to plant wildflowers failed. The first year, I at least had some flowers, but by year two, they were nearly gone. Box store wildflower mixes, which I didn't understand then, are not necessarily native to our area and contain mostly annuals. That, and I didn't, properly kill the fescue, which is not a native plant. So when you see those large hay fields and pastures, understand most aren't fescue and they do, most are fescue and they do not provide the habitat our, our birds and insects need to survive. Fescue now covers 14 million acres in Missouri, almost one third of our state. My screen has stopped. I'm going to turn off my video and maybe that will help. My screen isn't advancing for some reason. Oh, here we go. Okay, good. Sorry, guys. Since seeds didn't work, I tried buying plants at a nursery. The columbine was a cultivar. These plants have been bred to be different than the native and are often not as beneficial to insects. My lesson to always buy natives from a native plant nursery. I purchased a butterfly bush to bring back the butterflies I'd remembered so fondly. This plant is native to China and has not evolved with our butterflies. If you want butterflies, non-native plants, believe me, are not the answer. I planted a single yellow flag iris. In a few years, I had hundreds filling the ditches. 
I am still digging up sprouts of this plant every spring. There are approximately 280 species of virus. Most are native to Europe and Asia. Some are invasive, but sadly, you can still buy them. In 2018, we purchased my sister's adjoining six acres of the farm. By this time, much of the property had grown up in thick brush. This bush was abundant. We would now finally learn about invasive plants. While these non-native plants were brought here, their natural controls are not here. On top of the bush honeysuckle, we had autumn olive, multiflora rose, Japanese honeysuckle, field bindweed, winter creeper, gallery pear, and more. They were choking out young oaks and other native trees and plants. There are roughly 3,300 invasive species in North America, covering an estimated 133 million acres, choking out native vegetation, the lifeblood of our insects and birds. Additional evasives to be aware of, garlic mustard. Uh, one plant can have up to 8,000 seeds, which can live in the soil for up to 12 years. I did find that plant in our woodland this spring, so we're dealing with that. Cerecia lespedeza below each stem can drop 1,000 seeds, which can stay viable for 20 years. And teasel at the below right has over 3,000 seeds per plant. We also are dealing with some Cerecia in our uh, prairie area. Just so you know, the problem isn't confined to our property. There are scenes, these are scenes from nearby Jefferson City. But sadly, I could take similar photos in nearly every city. Once you know about invasive plants, you start to see the weight of the problem. I was filling up with gas when I looked out over the highway. Every white blooming tree you see is a gallery pear. This tree wasn't here when I was born. This tells you how quickly it has taken over. And as each one of these trees matures and seeds, the problem will just continue to expand. Nature used to be able to heal itself, but that was before invasive plants. We began the process of removing invasives and created roads around and through the property. We learned that just cutting invasives back brought back dozens of new sprouts around the stumps. The stumps had to be either immediately chemically treated or root docked. We used a dabber bottle for stump treatment to prevent overspray. During this time, we learned a lot. I had no idea. North America has lost 2.9 billion birds since 1970. That's 29% of our birds are gone. Grassland species suffered the largest loss at 53%. Habitat loss was most felt by this group. In Missouri, we've lost 80% of our bobwhite quail in 50 years. As a child, I remember running through our property and chasing up uh, little bobwhites running across the ground. And uh, man, it's been many, many, many years since I've seen those. Hundreds of North American birds are now threatened with extinction. 96% of North American land birds rely on soft-bodied insects to feed their young. Your bird feeders are feeding adult birds, but they will not help them feed their young. The protein, fat, and softness of caterpillars make them essential food for baby birds. 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars are needed to raise a single clutch of chickadees to the point of leaving the nest. And chickadees are not big birds. 90% of caterpillars are specialists relying on a certain family of native plants. 70% of an area must be in native plants for birds to raise a successful clutch of eggs. And birds aren't the only ones in trouble. Pollinators include bees, which do 80%. Other pollinators are butterflies, moths, wasps, flies, and beetles. 40% of pollinators are endangered. 90% of the world's flowering plants and 75% of our crops rely on pollinators. Honeybees were brought here from Europe and are not native. Over the last two decades, the Native American bumblebee population has decreased by 89% across the US. Pesticide use, habitat loss, and competition from non-native bees 
are some of the reasons for the decline. Only a small fraction of insects, less than 2% are pests. The rest are beneficial to humans, are important for food webs. 41% total global insect decline in the past decade. Where are the butterflies? 120 species of butterflies in Missouri, 1,400 species of moths in Missouri. They begin life as caterpillars and rely on native host plants. Now, I know you all have heard the story of the monarch, at least I hope you have, but I wanna share the numbers. In 40 years, the Western population of monarchs has dropped by 99%. They winter in California. The Eastern population of monarchs has dropped more than 80%. These are the ones we see in Missouri. They overwinter in Mexico. Loss of native habitat is one of the biggest reasons. Deforestation of overwintering sites, herbicide and pesticide use also add to the loss. Monarchs rely solely on milkweed plants as a host plant to lay their eggs and for their caterpillars to feed on. Native prairies are desperately needed. In 1821, Missouri had up to 15 million acres of native original prairie. Today, less than one half of 1% remain. I'm gonna say that again, one half of 1% remain. We met with the Missouri Department of Conservation private land specialist for our area. He was a great resource. He walked our property with us and together we developed a plan. He made us aware of cost share programs through the USDA and MDC designed to help pollinators by assisting landowners with the cost of restoring prairie areas. We divided our property into what would be restored prairie, formerly pes fescue, no, farmer pasture, mostly fescue, in the woodland, and we moved forward. My husband attended the prescribed burn class put on by the Missouri Department of Conservation. Proper fire breaks were cut and cleared ahead of the burn using the roads we had cut. We had spent the past year killing the larger invasive plants at this point. Fescue was not an issue in the woodland area. We did a prescribed burn of the woodland area in the winter of 2019. Did it work? The woodland responded with amazing fresh growth. My childhood woodland wildflowers were back. Each season brought new amazing plants. By year two, there were even more. Oh, there we go. Okay. None of these were planted. They were all just waiting in the forest seed bank for a chance to grow. The swamp rose was pretty amazing to me to see again. I remembered that as a child, especially uh, picking those for my mother. And uh, the swamp rose, when, when you're at it, where the stem of, of leaves attaches to the plant, there's no fringe. On a multiflora rose, there is fringe, and that's how you can tell the difference when they're not in bloom. The pasture area. We cleared what was pasture and would become our native prairie and savanna areas, removing invasives, cedar, and various other brush. We learned the non-native fescue that invaded this area had to be killed multiple times for the native seeds to have a chance. We followed the recommendation. The fescue was sprayed with herbicide fall of 2019, as well as spring and fall of 2020. First photo shows fescue pasture after one herbicide spray. I can tell you that uh, after one herbicide spray, the bulk of what came back was again fescue, because I imagine that was what was on top of the seed bank. Uh, the second spring in the bottom photo we were starting to see some real diversity. Um, not everything that came up was amazing, but at least it wasn't fescue. We were happy with that. 
With the clearing all done, final fescue spray fall of 2020, we burned the prairie area in December to allow for seed to soil contact and planted the native seeds in January of 2021. Native perennial plants take three years or more to fully come in. They spend the first year working on their extensive root systems. The second year, they grow slowly, but by year three, many should flourish. Once established, not only do natives not need watering or fertilizer, but they help recharge our important groundwater systems and reduce runoff and flooding. Natives improve air quality by absorbing and storing carbon dioxide while producing oxygen. These are the plants God meant to be here. So if you can see that fescue turf on the left side there, uh, the roots are less than a foot deep. So when it rains on fescue turf, the water does, uh, doesn't sink in very far. It mostly runs off. So meanwhile, on the native side, it's not on there, but common milkweed, the roots are 13 feet deep. So when it rains near common milkweed, that water gets brought down into the soil much further. They're so much better in so many ways. Prairie area 2021, just killing the fescue allowed the native seed bank a chance to thrive. So even before the seeds produced, we had some great surprises. And if you haven't seen a purple milkweed plant, they're just stunning plants. My childhood wildflowers were back here too. It's a sensitive briar that really hit me. As I knelt down to touch it, I remembered learning about this plant with my father some 50 years earlier. As I looked around, I realized that I was in roughly the exact spot where he had shown me long ago how the plant got its name. Choked out under the fescue for 30, 40 years, here it was again. And with them, guess what else was back? In fact, in fact, I started noticing lots of life again. The wild turkey in the lower right corner, um, I was walking in my woodland one day and I had chased up turkeys before, they always ran away, but this one jumped up out of nowhere and suddenly started circling me and gobbling. Now, I'm not a hunter, so I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know anything about it. I yelled at my husband and he told me I was threatening the nest. So I walked back out of the woods the way I came in, but I was very excited here we had a wild turkey nesting in our woodland. We have to help. One million plant and animals species face extinction in the next 20 years. And as Doug Tellamy says, guys, that just can't happen. And that reports from 2019. Animal populations worldwide have declined by 69% in the last 50 years. Habitat loss and invasive species are among the reasons. Over 40 million acres of America is in yards making lawns the number one irrigated crop, using more than 600 million gallons of gas to mow annually. Americans use 10 times more chemical pesticide on their lawns than farmers use on their crops. 93% of Missouri is privately owned. If birds, pollinators, and native plants are to survive, we need to rethink our yards and public lands. Non-natives such as daylilies, hostas, boxwoods, for instance, Scythias, mums, irises, long grasses, etc., do not support pollinators or birds. Native plants are at the heart of the food web for birds, insects, and mammals. Oak trees support 429 butterflies and moths in central Missouri, the top host plant. One third of global oaks are endangered. The percent of oaks in the eastern U.S. had been cut in half. Native cherry and plum trees are second oaks and supporting 318 butterflies and moths in central Missouri. What can you do? Remove invasive trees and plants from your property. Gallery pear, as they call them now, Cleveland pear, is just one example. 
These invasives and others are still being sold. So please help us spread the word. And I provide some links there. These are resources that I used um, when I was uh, identifying and treating uh, invasives. Replace exotic species on your property with native plants. Be sure to purchase native plants, not cultivars. To be sure your plant is free from harmful chemicals, purchase from a native plant nursery. See the GrowNative.org resource page for vendors. I just read a study where they were looking at box store milkweed plants and the average plant had 12 chemicals on it, all of which were harmful to caterpillars. So I can't stress enough buying them from a native plant nursery. Avoid the use of pesticides. Mosquito spray does not just kill mosquitoes. Reduce your yard space and establish a native area. Encourage native plantings in your community areas, city, church, school, et cetera, and help clear invasives. Plant an oak, black cherry, or other native tree or shrub. Read and learn. I recommend GrowNative.org as a first stop for information. Also watch the many great webinars reported by the Missouri Prairie Foundation. And finally, the book, Nature's Best Hope by Doug Tallamy, among others. Join the Missouri Prairie Foundation and please help us save and restore native areas in Missouri, as well as promoting the use of native plants. 2022, year two of the prairie planting, areas of Coryopsis and Foxglove gave way to a large crop of black-eyed Susans. In the Savannah areas, purple coneflower, Minarda, and golden Alexander already made a showing. Honestly, it's already an amazing place to be. Common milkweed is back in the same spot I remembered it as a child. New England asters and oxeye sunflowers in our planting were already prevalent. Invasives are popping up. We walk different areas and try to catch them before seeding. In the woodland area, continues to expand its diversity. Many young oaks have sprouted. Remember, we didn't have any that I saw when we started this. We walk the entire woods in the spring and in late fall, pulling or treating invasives as needed. Today, we have killed over 300 gallery pear trees. I pull Japanese honeysuckle and winter creeper vines, especially when the ground is wet. Don't try to do it when it's dry. When the ground is wet, works pretty good. And I hang it in nearby trees to help me remember to watch those areas in the future. Also, you don't want to throw it back down because it will just re-sprout if you throw it down. So you either need to carry it out or hang it on something where it's not going to hit the ground. Four sets of bluebirds nested. Tree swallows took over a birdhouse. Baltimore orioles nested in a walnut tree. Cardinals nested in a blackhaw tree. Chickadees nested on our house light. And goldfinches nested in common milkweed. Robins nested in our front yard. Many additional birds seen I have yet to identify or photograph. Owls heard regularly. The whipper will was heard singing this spring in our woodland. When I was a little girl, we heard it every spring, and that was the, the sound that meant we could go barefoot, which was a big deal. I remember it well. Mama said we could go barefoot when the whipper will called. Uh, so hearing that sound again was pretty amazing. Sorry. Clear increase in number and diversity of butterflies and moths. I planted marsh milkweed plugs in a ditch in 2020. Those expanded and were full of life as butterflies and other pollinators made use of them. The silvery checker spot caterpillar was feeding on one of our, its host plants, the black-eyed Susan. Common buckeye caterpillars had nearly eaten an entire slender false foxglove plant, one of several host plants. We witnessed numerous monarchs laying eggs and watched the entire life cycle take place. In the first photo there, you can see a monarch laying eggs on a purple milkweed. The second photo shows you those eggs right there on the blossoms, the buds of that 
purple milkweed. The third and fourth photos show you those caterpillars enjoying those milkweed buds. And the bottom left corner, that's a monarch crystallis. And when I say we have a front row seat to nature now, I mean it because that crystallis is hanging on our front porch chair. So we got to watch that second photo as the monarch came out right from our front door. By this time, I had turned all our uh, flower beds in our yards to natives because I was enjoying the life so much down in the prairie that I had to have it up at the house. So uh, we get to watch this close up. And the last photo I wanted you to see there is a swamp milkweed that I purchased. And I want you to see all the caterpillars enjoying it. You know, this plant, you can look at it and you can say, oh my gosh, they're devastating this plant. But they ate it completely down to a stem, but it came back the next year and thrived. These plants have evolved with this, so they survive it just fine. Clearing some of the clearing of some large multiflora rose bushes. And I mean, they were big and they were thorny, as well as honeysuckle, along with the burn in our lower woodland, resulted in a pawpaw grove expanding. We now see zebra swallowtails on a regular basis. The host plant of the zebra swallowtail is pawpaw. Pipevine swallowtails, previously a rare sighting on our property, are now abundant. Apparently, our work in the woodland has brought back their host plant and allowed them to flourish. I don't think I've ever seen a more vibrant blue than that. This uh, pipevine swallowtail was drying its wings, so I got to enjoy it flapping its wings for the first time. Prickly ash came up in a cleared area of our woodland, which is one of the host plants of the giant swallowtail. Now, I can't say I'm huge fan of this small tree, but I do enjoy seeing these butterflies and caterpillars on a regular basis. There's always something to see. The lower right corner of the Great Sprangled Fruital area is just a stunning butterfly. Their host plant is wild violets, so if you're spraying your large yard for weeds, you're killing possibly those. So we love wild violets here, and we have a lot, so we enjoy a lot of these butterflies. Oh dear. Okay, it was a purple milkweed where I, I was looking at the painted lady butterfly when I realized, oh, wait a minute, there's another butterfly, but it only has two spots on its wings. Well, who knew there was a painted lady and an American lady? So um, I discovered that while I was watching the purple milkweed one day. And then while I was walking by a purple coneflower plant that was in bud, I thought, why is there a leaf attached to it? Well, it ended up, it wasn't a leaf at all. It was a walnut sphinx moth uh, on it. And we do have walnut trees on our property. This fox and I have had two encounters now. If you sit quietly on a stump in the woods, it's amazing what will run right by you, not realizing you're there. I can't tell you how much we enjoy our property now. There was always so much life. It was a lot of work, but so worth it. And we can't wait to see what next year brings. That'll be year three, and we should expect to see more seed yet. I can't thank you enough for your time. Thank you, everyone. Now I'll see if I can get my video working again. Big. Thank you so much, Jane, for sharing a wonderful presentation on your beautiful property and all the amazing work that you have done to bring, uh, you know, natives back to this beautiful landscape. We do have some questions um, that have shown up in the chat or in the question and answer. So we'll go ahead and get to those. 
Um, one question came from Hunter and he said, thanks for the information moving forward. Will you just be spot treating with herbicide as needed and will you continue to conduct prescribed burns? Yes, both of those. Um, we both walk the property uh, quite a bit. You know, I used to belong to a gym. Now I just walk our prairie. <laughs> but uh, I look for uh, this time of year, I can still find Bradford pears. It's a great time of year to spot those. And those I treat with uh, my, my little dauber bottle. I stem cut them and treat them. Um, it's also after the frost is a great time um, because you want to wait until the native plants have all gone dormant after a frost. But things like the Japanese honeysuckle and the winter creeper are still green. So if I need to spray, which at this point we've gotten rid of most of that now. So now it's just a matter of pulling when the ground is wet. Never, never when it's frozen. Don't try to pull anything when it's frozen. But yes, I will be looking for Ceresia quite a bit in the prairie area. We have two spots where that comes up. And then in the woodland area, uh, this spring I'll be working, looking for that garlic mustard. But yes, we walk it regularly. It's fun to walk. That's how I get these pictures. I just walk and see, but I always also carry my supplies with me and treat what I find. We will be burning uh, the woodland area. We've divided now into three areas. We'll be burning it every three to five years, one parcel of it. And the prairie as well, we need to wait three years. We were instructed to let it go three years. So we'll be burning most of the prairie next year. Then we'll be on rotation with it. Thank you for that. Uh, the next question is from Val Frankowski. And um, the question is, did you seed at all? In the prairie area, yes, you saw him driving that Vicon cedar and seeding. Uh, that was had been fescue for quite some time. So we seeded pollinator in that area. In the woodland, though, all those wildflowers that you see in the woodland, nothing in the woodland was seeded. So that was all naturally in the seed bank. And I guess the beauty of it is I knew what this land should look like. I was raised here. And as a child, there wasn't fescue in our prairie or in our I knew how beautiful it should be. So um, uh, I knew our woodland didn't need any seed. It was beautiful if I could get it back. Great, thank you. Another question from Val was what trees were originally in your woodland or maybe when you started this process? Uh, well, it's an oak hickory woods. That's what it is. Uh, and, and so there was a lot of oak and hickory. There was older oak and hickory. What we were amazed by is there were no young oaks. And that's because the bush honeysuckle, when it comes up, it immediately spreads outward. And, and when it does that, it blocks light from the ground for everything underneath it. And it also puts out a chemical that, that, that keeps other things from spreading. So the bush honeysuckle had just taken hold and taken over a lot of areas. A lot of what we cut down was multiflora rose and bush honeysuckle. We sprayed a lot of vines. Sadly, we had Japanese honeysuckle vines. But then we did cut down a lot of trees only because we had to make those roads around the property so we'd have that burn break. So we cut roads all the way around the property and then two roads through the property. So we'd have those three areas to burn separately. Uh, and then we had a lot of hackberry came up and some prickly um, prickly ash. I love the giant swallowtails, but I didn't need as big a group of that as we had. So we kind of cut that back, but we still have it because I want to see those, those caterpillars and butterflies. Thank you. All right, the next question um, is from Jackie and she wanted to know how many total acres that you are restoring. We own a total of 15 acres. Uh, we, uh, we just recently, uh, two years ago, purchased uh, the family's old hay field. So we are gonna be planting another acre, which is an acre field into um, in the prairie this winter. So we burned that recently. So we'll be planting it in January. 
And then we reduced our yard and we'll be doing some more of that. So all in all, we have 15 acres. Uh, five of it is in prairie and the rest of it is in woodland. Great, thank you. The next question comes from Nikki. Um, she wanted to know, um, she lives on 3.5 acres, mostly woodland, but close to other properties. Um, would help with a prescribed burn be something that would be available for her? Or where did you find um, you know, help in that process for prescribed burning? Well, my husband, uh, luckily I was raised on a farm and my father did burns. So I had some experience with him. My husband was raised on a farm. He had done burns, but I, I can't stress enough the uh, information that you would get gather from going to the uh, Missouri Department of Conservation's pres prescribed burn class. I think Missouri Prairie Foundation also does them. Uh, you, it's just a wealth of information. Um, I can't recommend that enough. Secondly, I believe, check out the resources page on the Grow Native site. Uh, there may be some people that could help you with a burn there. Um, because uh, you do you do want more than one person to do that. You need several people and, and do it correctly uh, back up. But yes, I, I would burn any piece of property that you can. Uh, I can't, I just, I mean, you can see what it did for our woodland and for our prairie. I'm, I'm, my husband teases that I, I can't wait to burn something because <laughs> I just enjoy what it looks like that following spring when you do. So yes, do the proper precautions. Uh, please, but but yes, I, I can't recommend it enough. Great question that came in was from Christine, and she wondered if the land had ever been plowed. No, no. Um, we had a garden area that had been plowed, but uh, that area uh, belongs to my daughter, who now own who now lives in the homestead that I was raised in. Uh, but no, the property had never been planned. Great. Another question from Charles. Um, of course, he wanted to thank you for the presentation, but he wanted to know, did you burn, treat, or mow in the first three years of developing the prairie after the initial burning or herb herbicide treatment, or did you just leave it be? We did do some um, some mowing. Uh, one of the things my husband did, because what you do is when you when you treat that stuff, it all dies, and and uh, that's a good thing. But it can lay on top and block things. Um, so um, we uh, we had one area that was really really thick. So my husband drug a log behind the tractor to knock everything down, and we did burn that spot just so we could get to the ground, to the green stuff that was below there to spray it. Cause um, we didn't want the fescue not to get sprayed under that thatch, but we, it was too thick. So we did burn that area as a rule. And then the first year after you seed a prairie, you seed it that, and then the first spring annuals are gonna come up cause those perennials are working on their roots and they don't come up, but annuals do. Not every annual is something you want to seed, so they do recommend mowing that first year. So we did mow probably three to four times, depending on the area and what was coming up, um, just to keep again that that you know wild carrot, Queen Anne's lace, whatever you want to call it, the parseweed, the burnweed, to keep all that from seeding. Great, thank you for that. Um, on a couple of questions about your lovely photography, Jane. Um, Val wants to know what kind of camera you use out in the field. Well, about um, every picture I took was that you saw was on our property, except for the ones of the scenes of Jefferson City. About 50% were just done with my iPhone. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, it's not the photographer here, guys. It's just the beauty that God provides. I mean, these, these, you know, these, 
creatures are, and these plants are just stunning. Um, I I didn't do that. It's it's just it's that pretty. Uh, I do have a D thirty five hundred camera that does have a zoom um, to two hundred that helps me get the birds. My birds pictures are the worst because I I just they're hard to photograph. So <laughs> I try, but I. I think I need a better camera for that. I, if you want a birding camera, what I have isn't it. But thank you very much. It's just that it's that pretty. It's certainly not me. So Tony wanted to also commend you on the great photography. And he was wondering if you're making any plans for the future preservation of your property. Well, uh, we're gonna we're gonna take good care of it for as long as I'm able to, and then, uh, like I said, my daughter lives next door in the homestead, so um, I have, and we are, uh, we have some grandchildren that walk down there, and we we show them, and I'm hoping we're preparing another generation to love what we love, but um, that's that's my prayer anyway, and if the day that a uh, I run into a bob white, white quail in that property. Everyone is going to know it because I'm going to kneel down and just cry right there on the spot. <laughs> All right, one more question it looks like, uh, actually two, um, for one from Janet. She wanted to know if the um, hay fields had uh, of fescue had ever been hayed there. Um, she believes that it would be difficult for, uh, since they hay their property, it'd be difficult for her to convince her husband to, um, you know, give up the hang. Uh, yeah, the uh, the acre that we're going to be uh, the seeding this winter was our hay field, uh, and it had been hayed, but, uh, you know, my husband and I really don't have any interest in raising cattle anymore, so we don't have a need for a hay field. Um, we were giving the hay, uh, you know, we're letting a neighbor have the hay, but uh, I'd rather turn it into prairie. So that's what's happening. And, you know, the neighbor was very kind about that because he enjoys walking by and seeing the flowers. So he, <laughs> he was very kind. So no, uh, you know, my husband initially is, he's a deer hunter and he was a big fan of food plots and so forth. But you know, I can't tell you someone who enjoys more standing on her deck and watching the deer behind her house all the time now. So he's uh, become a big believer. He's he's all full bore on helping me. And and I, I suspect if if uh, you show your husband maybe my presentation or or just bring him to a, a remnant prairie of the Missouri Prairie Foundation, uh, it's hard not to just fall in love with him. All right. Well, thank you so much for answering all of those questions. Did uh, one last question? Do you have any um, any I guess plan to offer your land as a conservation easement? Not at this time, um, but we do uh, uh, we do mow trails, and I. Um, you know, if people want to come visit, um, we would, uh, you know, I welcome visitors to come take a walk with me. <laughs> I'm walking it every day anyway. So. <laughs> that was a question from James. Thanks for that question. All right. Well, I think that uh, wraps up the, the questions that were asked. Um, as I had mentioned before, this webinar is being recorded and an email will be sent to all the participants tomorrow with the webinar link. And that will also include uh, other helpful resources mentioned today in the presentation. Um, we just really want to thank Jane and her great, um, again, presentation and photography and story of how she was able to bring natives back to her family um, farm. We hope that uh, our participants will join us in the new year when we host the Grow Native Master Class Landscaping with Native Wetland Plants with Alan Branhagen on January 4th at 4 p.m. 
Lastly, if you can, please consider giving $10 or more to support the Grow Native program through Como Gives so we can continue sharing excellent content like Jane's webinar. Currently, we have raised over $3,000, but are just short of our 4,000 goal for that Como Gibbs campaign. The link, I believe, to that campaign will be provided in our chat. Uh, there are some other um, items that weren't covered in the chat today. Uh, we will make sure and also include uh, any questions that were left over from the chat in the email follow-up email tomorrow. So I believe that concludes our presentation today and we really appreciate Jane and all of you for your time and efforts in bringing natives back to our state. Thank you very much. Have a great evening and holiday. <laughs>